Okay, we're going to talk about the California energy crisis and how the government set up a structure that allowed electrical generating facilities to game the system and uh, essentially rob California $40 billion. So in 1978, PURPA was set up, the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act. And what it said was that the independently owned utilities like PG&E it required them to purchase power from any qualified facility at the avoided cost. So the intention was to increase renewable energy. So if a company put a large solar field out in a desert, for instance, PG&E would have to purchase the electrical energy from them. They were required to pay at avoided cost. And so this, is, this should be the marginal cost. It should be the cost of the facility that you would have to turn off in order to accept this renewable energy. And so of course PG&E might have argued, well we would turn off some hydro and that's free for us. In fact, arguments could be made that the long run avoided cost is that they don't have to build new facilities in the long run and they have avoided capital cost. Then later in 1996, by a unanimous vote, there was Assembly Bill 1890. It required the power providers to sell their power production facilities. So PG&E had to sell their generation facilities. So they were no longer vertically integrated. The thought was that this would free the power providers from worrying about power production. It would also require the power producers to have to compete to sell their electricity to the power providers. So the different generation facilities would have to compete and lower their prices in order to sell their electricity to PG&E. Additionally, the government threw in a requirement to discount electricity by 10% and therefore freezing the price of electricity below the market value. And so we'll see how this can get us into big trouble when we don't allow the market to operate freely. Okay, they only said you had to sell off your power facilities. LA refused to. We might have noticed from the map that LA is not part of the California independent system operator, that they're independent. LA has power facilities outside of LA that bring electricity into the city and they kept them. And so this is a timeline when PURPA was enacted, when Assembly Bill 1890 passed, and then two years later the retail competition opened so they opened the market up. And the market functioned for about two years and then failed. Let's take a look at the cost of electricity over this period of time. This is a cost of electricity in the power exchange. This is kind of like the Wall Street just for electricity, where, they, where the wholesale cost of electricity is determined. And so we can see that the cost of electricity in 1998 was well below five cents a kilowatt hour, so on the order of three cents a kilowatt hour. 1999, we have some problems here in June when we have peak demand. 2000, it's much worse. But then something very interesting happens is we have huge price spikes in January when we should have a very low demand and therefore a very low price. And it was in 2001 that they terminated the market. We can see that the cost of electricity went well over a dollar a kilowatt hour. Keep in mind, at this time we were paying that price for electricity to all the power producers. So they were getting very rich and PG&E and the state was going bankrupt. So how did this happen? So up to 1994, on average, only 10% of the facilities were down for maintenance. But in the winter of 2001, we found that almost 40% were down for maintenance. What the, the power providers realized is that if they got pushed up on this curve, if they could push the market in this direction where these peaker plants that normally have a duty cycle of 2%, if they had to be used, then everybody would get this very, very high price for electricity. So what would happen is they would take turns closing for, quote, maintenance. And therefore, the California ISO would have to dispatch peaker plants that were very expensive. Every power producer gets paid the maximum price, so they took turns having maintenance outages. Governor Gray Davis made matters worse because he said we are going to not have blackouts. No matter how much we pay, 
we are going to pay it so we always have energy. So you can imagine how the companies like Enron responded when they were told, oh, you know, we'll pay whatever you make us pay. And so we actually had blackouts in winter when the demand should have been very low. And it turns out that Enron was not the only price gouger. Its own independently owned utility that did not sell its power providers was also involved in this. Enron also had other mechanisms for, law, for, for gaming money. For instance, the Death Star, they had these names. These are all from internal documents. The Death Star was a, a technique whereby they would overschedule the amount of electricity they were going to transport across certain lines, knowing that those would be very necessary. And then the state would turn around and say, hey, we'll pay you to not send any electricity in those lines because we need to use them. And they'd say, sure, because they didn't. They would take the money to not ship the electricity they had never intended to ship to begin with. So moving on, how do we make the market go in this direction so we don't have this problem? And the key is, is that the person making the decision, that would be the consumer, has to bear the cost of that increased electricity price. And so they have to be made aware that the price goes up and they have to be charged for it. This is, what's this is partly what's behind the smart grid and demand side management. So it says here demand side management is to make incentives to control demand. Yes, there were incentives whereby if you reduced your electricity use, you got an additional rebate. However, just allowing the capitalistic market to function <clears throat> provide significant decrease in demand when the cost goes up. And so you might ask yourself, how would we have functioned differently if the people were aware and had to pay these exorbitant costs? Well, first of all, this would never have happened because they would have lowered their demand. I think of at the time of the California energy crisis, I would get emails saying, you got to turn all your lights off. And if instead they had sent a message out, that the price of electricity had just gone up by a factor of 50. Well, the deans and the president of the university would be running around in the halls making people turn their lights off, or we would just close school for the day. Or certainly, very electricity-rich industries would close and say, look, you guys stay at the beach for the day. <clears throat> I, I define the smart grid as real-time pricing or dynamic electricity pricing, along with two-way communications and control. So, and we call this demand response or demand side management. And you can do two things. You can shift your load. That means you use the electricity at night rather than the day. Or you can shed your load, which means you just decrease your electricity demand. So one of the things that this allows us is to charge consumers for the real price of electricity at that time. We can look here and just, uh, just to get an idea of what the cost of electricity is in different countries. We can see that in the United States, the cost of electricity is rather the cost of electricity is rather low. However, the this is actually eight cents a kilowatt hour, and you know in California we pay fifteen. So California we pay reasonably high electricity costs, but not as high as in Japan. And so this is one of the reasons, for instance, Japan has really pushed for solar electricity, even though Japan is not a very sunny area. So we look at the free market, and. Under what conditions does a free market not function? There are a number of actions that undermine a free market. One of them is subsidies, where a company gets money just from the government, or external costs. Ex external costs are very important. They're where, they're where the decision maker, the consumer, doesn't bear the full costs. The internal costs that you pay are often just the costs of extraction, the price of extraction of the energy. However, the downstream and upstream costs of the environment and to other people, you're not responsible for. So for instance, the cost of pollution. It turns out that the petroleum industry, the petroleum and coal industries may be responsible for 100,000 deaths a year in the United States. In China, it would be much more. There's opportunity costs. For instance, if I were to say, let's dam up Yosemite River, and fill Yosemite Valley with, uh, with the reservoir to generate very cheap electricity, people would say, no, because it's worth a lot of money to us to have this as in the park. However, this is exactly what we did with Hetch Hetchy Dam. 
or loss of carrying capacity or ecosystem services. For instance, water is purified through the natural environment. So for instance, I remember passing a gas station, seeing a woman filling up her Hummer. And I remember thinking, why am I paying you to turn my daughter's petroleum into carbon dioxide and criteria pollutants in her atmosphere? So why would I feel resentment? Because this woman was freely exercising her right to buy at market price gasoline. And so we might think of where are there external costs involved here in this statement and where are there subsidies involved in this statement? And how could we assess the proper cost to society so that I would not have to feel bad about seeing her spend money on gasoline? And I've seen quotes that the true cost of a gallon of gas to society is about $15 a gallon when you consider the effect in the environment of, of mining it, the pollution from burning it, and the opportunity costs of what we might potentially do with gasoline if we let it sit in the ground for when it's very, very dear. So we can look at estimates by Kamen showing the cost of producing electricity by different technologies, throwing in the subsidy, and a range of values from minimal to maximal external costs. So for instance, photovoltaic is very expensive, but the subsidy that the government used to supply has brought the price down to be a little more competitive. You take a look at coal, it's very inexpensive. However, the external costs due to, um, due to respiratory deaths, related respiratory deaths mostly, can push the actual cost to society to much higher, I mean, 40 to 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, if these were assessed in a carbon tax or a pollution tax, we would not have to put regulations on coal production because the market would prohibit them. So here's another example of a price distortion. And so there you go. So hopefully you're able to answer these questions reasonably well now.